Welcome to Monsterology. Today we're going to look at a strange creature, a gigantic bird called the rock or the rook. It uh, appears in 1001 Nights or the Arabian uh, Tales, um, but it may go back to the Mahabharata text, the epic poem of the Hindu tradition, um, and it may be tied to the Garuda, which is a giant uh, bird man creature. The story of this creature is that it's massive and huge and it could lift an elephant and carry it if it wants to. And it appears in some wonderful stories and uh, the pictorial tradition. So we're going to do a drawing um, and t I'll tell you a little bit about the story of the rock and um, we'll understand the sort of notion of a monstrous raptor. But also interestingly, as uh, many of you have noticed, I think, um, Oftentimes, it's, a, it's not just a monster, but also a god. And it's the same thing in this case. We have a god monster, um, both terrible and terrifying, but also awesome, inspiring, and possibly divine. All right, today, The Rock. So here's the image that uh, I'm going to be drawing today, and it's based on some historical images from the Renaissance period. I just love this kind of etching style, and I'm going to show you how I did it. Uh, from start to finish here while I tell you the story of the rock or the rook. It's um, a fascinating bird creature. I think many of us are are sort of intrigued and frightened by the idea of a giant raptor and it shows up in a lot of folklore and in contemporary movies and horror. Um, there are these giant birds um, that lived in times past whose fossils and skeletons we've found that were just enormous. But even some very large raptors today, like eagles, um, can actually pick up not just sort of sheep and small um, animals, but have actually picked up children and tried to cart them off. And in some cases, uh, they've been successful. Uh, so I think it's one of the main fears that human beings have. And in our prehistory, there would have probably been a lot more of that. Um, anyway, this idea of the rock or the rook um, may go back as far as the Mahabharata. And I refer you to a great art historian, Rudolf Wittkauer, who uh, wrote a series of books, and one of his collections is called Allegory and the Migration of Symbols. And it's just fascinating art history, uh, where he's looking at how do images um, like the hydra or the rook or you know, a cyclops, how do they travel from one culture to another and what happens in that transmission? Um, in the Mahabharata, which is a uh, ancient um, Sanskrit epic um, about sort of fighting cousins, this is sort of common in Hindu epics. You find this in the Ramayana, in the Mahabharata, where two, two sort of distantly related families are battling it out, and it's a giant epic war between them. And in section 23 of the Mahabharata, there's a section describing the birth and the nature of the Garuda, and in later uh, Hindu um, writings, you'll see the Garuda oftentimes described and also um, painted as the steed or the mount for Vishnu. So it's a birdman that Vishnu rides on. But in this section, it's a little different. It seems more like a cosmic bird of some kind. I'm going to read you just a couple of brief lines here, maybe two paragraphs here from the Mahabharata. Quote, in the meantime, uh, when his time came, burst forth from the egg without the help of his mother Garuda of great splendor, enkindling all the points of the universe, that, uh, that mighty being endued with strength, that bird capable of assuming at will any form or going at will everywhere, and of calling to his aid at any moment and any measure of, of energy. Effulgent like a heap of fire, he shone terribly, of luster equal to that of the fire at the end of the yuga. His eyes were bright like the lightning flash. And soon after birth, that bird grew in size and increased his body, ascending the skies. Fierce and vehemently roaring, he looked as terrible as second ocean fire. And all the deities seeing him sought the protection of Vibhavasa, or Agni. And Agni, just to sort of time out here, end quote, Agni is the in Sanskrit for fire. It represents the fire god of Hinduism, sort of second only to Indra in the Vedic tradition. And uh, he's equally the fire of the sun um, and sort of appears also in the domestic and the sacrificial hearth. Um, anyway, back to the Mahabharata. 
in describing Garuda, they say he is the mighty son of Kashyapa, the destroyer of the Nagas. And, and uh, the Nagas are giant cobras or giant snakes that feature pr predominantly in Hindu mythology. So the, the, the rock is a Naga killer and also kills other demons like the Rakshasas. So it continues, quote, be not afraid of it in the least, come with me and see. And so Agni sort of introduces uh, the rock to, uh, to all the other beings. And we learn that the rock is not just a giant bird, but also, quote, thou art supreme, O pacify thy anger and preserve us. At thy voice, loud is the roar of the thunder, the ten points, the skies, the heavens, the earth and our hearts, O bird, thou art continuously shaking. O diminish this thy body resembling Agni at the sight of the splendor resembling that of Yama, when in wrath our hearts lose all equanimity and quake. And so they're freaking out, basically. And as a response to this, the giant bird rock uh, reduces its size and says, okay, I'll take it easy on you guys. I'm too awesome for you. And so I'm gonna reduce my size and I won't frighten you with my power, but just be aware that I'm always sort of lurking in the background. <laughs> so uh, watch yourselves. And this is a theme that comes up a lot in monsterology. We've seen this many times where a monster is not just a uh, sort of demonic n negative uh, creature, but also uh, particularly in the Eastern traditions is divine and has a divinity to it. And God himself, herself, itself is also terrible in this way. So there's something about just the raw power of this creature that's sort of indicated in this story. And some art historians like uh, Wittkauer have suggested that that influenced the Arabic tradition of the rock. And this bird appears in 1001 Nights, or the Arabian Nights as it's sometimes referred to, which is a sort of compilation of Arabic folk tales uh, compiled in the 1800s, well, in the 1700s, really, um, as the Arabian Nights. And in there, we learn the story of uh, Agib, uh, son of uh, King Kasib. And Agib is an adventurer, and he can't resist uh, going on adventures and nor can he resist his own desires and curiosity so he goes on this adventure and he he actually ties himself up in a um a calfskin and the giant bird the rock grabs him carries him to a, a sort of special golden castle he gets inside the castle which is just a land of pleasure and satisfied desires but there's a forbidden door the golden door he's not allowed in there he goes in anyway and then gets his eye knocked out uh, by a giant black horse. Um, I don't know what this means except uh, the sort of common folk tale that you need to rein in your own desires and cravings. It's fairly common. The, the bird monster, the rock, plays a fairly minimal role in this story, but you get the quote there, uh, uh, quote, a great white bird is so strong, the rock, that he has been known to carry even an elephant uh, to his nest in the hills, end quote. So that's a fairly common theme that appears in other stories about the rock. It gets repeated in Marco Polo in the 13th century, uh, where he references it saying that it, it's different from the griffin uh, and that it probably lives in Madagascar. And then this gets repeated um, also in uh, Antonio uh, Pigafetta, uh, who explored um, the, the south with Magellan actually in 1519. So on that adventure, uh, Pigafetta is going with him and then describes it later. Magellan is actually killed on this expedition in 1519. He describes the rock. This influences artists, including Str Stradanus, and you get etchings of it in the 1590s. And then there's references to the rock actually in Aldrovandi, that great Italian natural historian who had one of the first collections or museums. Um, and so he included a description of the rock in his Ornithologia in 1599. And it raises this interesting question about like what, what, what were people thinking about that, that spawned this legend of the rock? And some possible real sources could be, you know, just these raptors I was describing at the beginning. There are these giant birds that can carry off sheep and even young kids. Uh, but also, you know, uh, the, the skeletons and fossil finds of giant birds like the moa 
The moa, there were nine species of extinct flightless birds in New Zealand, uh, some as tall as 12 feet. So imagine a 12 foot bird uh, running around because these were, as I say, flightless. Um, when we encounter these kinds of fossils and these skeletons, you'll recall from many other episodes of Monsterology, it, it's sort of the kernel of truth around which the legends sort of snowball and, and continue to build and extrapolate. There's also giant eggs that uh, Europeans found on Madagascar, and so this also helped sort of codify the legend, really, of a giant bird creature. Um, so I think this is uh, a monster that's not that well known, I think, in the West. I mean, obviously there's references to it here from uh, the uh, religious traditions, but also in the, the sort of literature of the adventurers, like Marco Polo and Magellan and so forth. Um, but I thought it was worth doing an episode of monsterology on this because it's not as well known, perhaps, as the griffin, uh, much better known in the Greek and Roman uh, period. So here's the drawing, and I'm peeling off the, the tape, as you can see here, which is always satisfying. You can see I used uh, sort of pencil to put it down, then I used ballpoint for the first shading round, then watercolors, and finally pen and ink um, for the last sort of uh, articulation and rendering. And I'm fairly pleased with how that turned out, and I hope you are too. Uh, if you like this kind of thing, please come back for more. Hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time. Take care.